Good evening. And then you guys say good evening back. There we go. All right. All right. Um, for those of you uh, who have uh, worked with me, you know I usually don't do notes, but there, there's quite a bit to say about uh, our speaker today, Dante Hayes. So I do have a few notes uh, prepared. Feel free to ignore any of those notes if it means you are spending that time finding this thing in your pocket and turning the sound off for me. I would really appreciate that. Um, our speaker today is Dante K. Hayes. He earned his BFA in ceramics and printmaking from Kennesaw State University in Georgia, and he received his MFA and MA with honors from the University of Iowa. Dante Hayes is an incredible researcher, uh, not just of art history, but of many different social histories. And he engages in incredibly long periods of research before he ever touches a slab of clay. This sometimes can work out to a ratio of up to nine months of researching uh, before about three months of what we would call more traditional studio time in any given year. And um, knowing that, you can understand why he is an incredible person for us to bring to our academic, academic campus and engage with our students and our faculty across a broad range of disciplines. So just this week, Dante is speaking to art, architecture, art history students, but also students in Africana studies, in women's and gender studies, um, and sociology. Dante is the grand prize winner of the Coined in the South 2022 exhibition at the Mint Museum. He's the 2019 winner of the 1858 Prize for Contemporary Southern Art from the Gibbs Museum of Art. And most recently, we are very excited to say that Dante Hayes was awarded the prestigious Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Grant Award. Um, he is included in many collections across this country, including the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, the Gibbs Museum of Art in Charleston, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas, the Newark Museum in New Jersey, and most importantly, the Welland Museum of Art. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're incredibly proud to have six works by Dante in the collection. All of them are on view downstairs, either in the exhibition gallery or in our object study gallery. If you have not yet had the opportunity, I really encourage you to go downstairs after our talk today and um, spend a few minutes with those works. We will have time for some questions at the end, so save up those questions. If you are tuning in um, on Zoom, go ahead and use that Q&A function to post your queries, and we'll um, try and answer as many of those as possible. So thank you all for being here, and please help me welcome Dante Hayes. Do this. excited about being here since Monday because like this is my third time yeah. being in the space of Hamilton but this time I get to see people the other times it was like you know no one was here but like there's three people <laughs> so it's like it feels good to see the you know the whole community here right am I right oh yeah okay uh, we're gonna we're gonna get it loud <laughs> I wish we had some popcorn so the people that are on zoom they're gonna be eating their popcorn having a good old time right <laughs> Do this. Nice. Get down. Yeah, get down. Get down. As you, um, as Alexander said, my name is Dante K. Hayes, and I'm from the future. <laughs> yes, I did say I am from the future. And why do you think I said that? Because everything in my whole being thinks about the future and how we should live as human beings, not just walking around thinking that, you know, I'm not supposed to talk about anything and not care about what's going on, I just need to worry about what I'm doing. No, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. And those who have seen me all this week, they know I keep it real. Mm -hmm. You know, to sometimes kind of scares people, like, wait a minute, what you, what you talking about? Right? But I have to do that because that's how I live my life, just like I live my work. Um, growing up, back in the 80s and 90s, I didn't see a lot of black people on TV. You know, it was, that's the reason why it was fun that I was talking to Alexander about a different world. I know that's something that maybe no one ever heard of, but it was like Bill Cosby show and then a different world. Mm -hmm. And they would go, they were at a college and they were like, cool people would come there, like Tupac would be there, you know, it was like amazing. And they were like talking about real issues. And that made me think like, man, I want to go to college one day, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because like I get to talk about real issues. So Star Trek Next Generation was my show. 
because I finally saw black people in the future. You know, I even thought Warp was a brother. You know what I mean? He, he was a brother to me. You know what I mean? Come on. Warp was a trip, wasn't he? He was like, he was supposed to be a Klingon. He always got his butt whooped. You know? So I thought that was funny that like everyone had a breath of life. It wasn't just like there was trauma going on and there was joy. You saw them as human beings, not just like one or the other, the characters. That's why I thought that show was amazing. Um, for me, I love reading, but I have issues. I have dyslexia. So it's very hard for me to read. You know, when I was in high school, I got C's and D's. You know, I, you know, so I wasn't a good student. You know, especially because like high school's hard. You know, that really was funny that I was in college and I got straight A's. Mm -hmm. But when I was in high school, they didn't have no, you know, you have accommodations. It was such a thing when I was going to high school. So I was doing not well. Mm -hmm. So my parents were like, so what do you like? I was like, well, I love science fiction. I love basketball. But we're not going to give you no books about basketball. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you a book about, you know, what about Fahrenheit 451? So it was the first book that I got that I actually was able to read because it was powerful to me. You know, the idea of the wall um, 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 screen that we have now that kind of explains like how the whole world is. But now, actually, the future is actually small. It's not the large wall screen that we thought of. It's actually we can walk around having your own world in this little screen. I think that was deep, that like those things were like coming through in, in, as, a, as a young person. But then also I was like, these um, books that I was reading never talked about black people again. You know? And that's the reason why I'm so thankful for my parents. They were like, do you know who a KV Butler was? And I was like, who, what, who? You know? And, and I was like, okay, please give me books about that. So I read a lot of Octavia Butler books when I was younger. And that really started to get me to think about how black people and all people can live in the future. So growing up, I love comic books. That's why I'm a comic book nerd too, as well as sci-fi nerd. And um, something about me, I, ever since I was 18 years old, I always made money off of my work. I only had three like regular jobs. When I was in high school, I worked at Burger King. Represent, I love me some Burger King. You know, sometimes you gotta have some garbage food. I worked at Michaels and Sherwin Williams. But all the rest of my life, I was always making money doing what I love is art. And I used to work for a company called Jericho Comics that was in Atlanta, now there in San Antonio. And it was all black owned, and they made comic books about all people. They had one comic book called Yeshuva, and God was an Asian woman in it. And that's like, and I did all the inking for all of the comics oh. there. And I got paid to do that mm -hmm. at 18 and to like 21 and stuff. But isn't that amazing that I was able to do that right out of high school? Because I didn't sit around acting like, I can't do it because I'm young. Mm -hmm. Or I can't do it because I never went to college. I just said, I'm good at this. I want to show and say, hey, here is my resume. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh man, your work is good. We'll give you a try, you know? So also, being in Atlanta, I love hip-hop. Don't we all love hip-hop up in here? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. I was able to um, um, be in the class for introduction of sculpture with Professor Amy. That was fun. And I was like, well, where's the music at? There is no music up in here? Come on. That's how I make my work. And we'll go into that further when I actually start talking about the work. And we were like, so what do you want to listen to? I was like, let's put some MF Doom on there. Right? Let's get some real stuff up in this piece. So um, I had a good friend whose cousin, his cousin was one of the members of Criss Cross. And I don't know, I mean, I was kind of old school, so probably a lot of people don't know who Criss Cross is in this song. Because <laughs> I felt real old when I brought it out last time. They were like, Criss, ooh! You know, but maybe somebody on Zoom knew what I'm talking about. And so, like, we went over to their house, and he was like, oh, man, you could do work. So, well, like, I made work for them and then did some other things. And I did some um, fashion um, works for different works for um, Jermaine Dupri and things of that nature growing up. So, also, as Alexander said, I, I love history, but all history. But I'm going to specifically talk about this history because this is the history that all the way from kindergarten, even up to undergrad, and even to grad school, we never really talked about in a way that I actually thought was showing respect to people, those people on those boats. And like, the first thing they would say, oh man, yeah, um, they, they were slaves and they, they came from Africa. I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. What's Africa? 
It's a continent, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can speak. It's a mm -hmm. continent. Mm -hmm. It's not a country, right? So first of all, they didn't even, couldn't even tell me that part. Well, what area? Mm -hmm. They didn't even say it was West Africa, most likely, where most of them came from. They couldn't even say that. I had to find all that on my own. I had to do my own knowledge base. And that was before, you know, Googling. You know, I had to actually get a book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason why I wanted to put this map. Because every time I sit around talking about Nigeria or Burkina Faso, where my ancestry really came from, people don't know what I'm talking about. So I decided, let me just put a map up. Because usually when I say Italy, everyone knows what that looks like. Mm -hmm. But if I say ben, um, Bunin, they're like, who? Who that? What at? You know? It's like next to Togo. You know? Like they can't, they can't remember anything. You know? I have to say it on my own, right? So, the blue area. <laughs> I love this. I love this. This is great. We're doing good. <laughs> so in um, undergrad, um, we were talking about um, these beautiful Ife heads. And in 1910, a German explorer named Leo Forbinius, he so-called said he discovered them and, and put them out of the ground, right? Mm -hmm. But, and then when he picked it up and saw these beautiful heads, the first thing he thought was, this must be from the lost city of Atlantis. He couldn't even think these beautiful, natural-looking um, heads could be from someone that looked like me. That's messed up. That even when you're in a country of all black people, you're still thinking Greeks made it, right? And then steal them. And then we have, you know, the British Museum thinking that they have the right to keep them. <laughs> right? Let's talk about that. That's crazy. We're in a museum right here. This is a good museum. They're actually thinking about these things. So from that made me start thinking... I'm going to make a painting about that, but, you know, make it my own way, you know. Formally, let's look at the different lines um, formating the head. Everybody always thinks that that means scarification and things of that nature. It does not mean that. These are, is a representation of how much wealth and knowledge and royalty you are. So that made me starting to think, you know, looking at the piece, look at the, the neck area. It made me think of a light bulb. You know, I was being illuminated by knowing something that I never even was taught before. You know, I was actually becoming one with my ancestors. And of course, you know, I love hip hop, so I added a headdress to make it look like it's like a boom box mm -hmm. that we could all learn from our past. And this is a painting. So yes, I do paint. <laughs> so now we're gonna talk about some ceramics, yeah. <laughs> And so I took that idea and pushed it forward and thought, like, I can make that three-dimensional. So in undergrad, um, I only started taking ceramics for only two years. So um, I graduated in 2017 undergrad, and I started working ceramics in 2015. So it's 2023, so I have not worked in ceramics very long. And it's, like, amazing that I'm, you know, I actually have work here in the Welling Museum. It's like, wow. But so I took that idea of that hit and then pushed it to the ideas that I'm always thinking about, how music can create resonance to each other. So actually, this boombox can actually play music, you know? And it has a Bluetooth in it, so I can just press a button, and then it just plays automatically on time. And it's like the uh, idea of a ghost, because I am a ghost here, if you didn't know. <laughs> Inside joke for those. <laughs> but um, so... Um, in 2016, I went to, um, excuse me, yeah, 2016, I, I went, you know, out of the country, and I went to France, I went to Italy, um, Switzerland, I also went to Cuba that year, but it was deep to me when I um, saw um, Notre Dame, the cathedral, where everybody was doing their, oh, oh, you know, feeling awe, I was feeling like anger, you know, if you notice, the stained glass right here. You see these? Hello? Do you see these yeah. in here? Yeah. Okay, but we're going to talk. We can talk. You know? While everybody was doing the awe moment, I was seeing that. Look at the difference. I'm going to go put it back so you can see what I'm seeing. Boom. Even in the iconography in these beautiful churches, they were, you know, subconsciously creating their world. You know, isn't that deep? I never thought about it until when I saw that. Mm -hmm. That it was just the same way. Of like, we have the right to, because God gave us this right, that we can enslave other people, and we're going to even do it just like the iconography. 
in those um, stained glass windows. I thought that was deep. Yes, I do have interesting connections to things. <laughs> so, if you've ever been to Italy, you can never get Pepsi. I'm not a Pepsi person, I'm from Atlanta anyway. I love me some Coke. What up? <laughs> if anybody in Coke, please, you know, you, you know, you can give me some money too. I mean, I'm hoping I'll love. But um, I was like, that's deep. And what it was, what is the um, logo for Coke? Coke is it. So the idea of black labor is what they want. So I was like, man, this is deep. So when I went back home to Atlanta, I created this piece called New Frontier because I wanted to make those um, slave ships change just like Star Trek. Like, what if it was a different kind of world that they were able to escape and can make their own world and leave and make a new frontier? So all of the um, work here is made out of clay except for the um, Coca-Cola crate as well as the hair coming out. And I tried this joke once, I'm going to try it again. As you can see, I do that for my art. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and the, the hair is like a representation of like DNA. So no matter where you are, because like the explosion comes up, so you know that and all of the like um, flowing cloud. So I'm saying that even though I've never been to Africa, I'm still African. And you can see it close up. And all, like I said, all those little heads are made out of clay. So that's when I started to realize what I was really doing. I was really talking about what, how do we constitute a home. So in 2017, as Alexander said, I went to um, University of Iowa to study um, ceramics and printmaking. And when I got there, I did not feel welcome at all. I would walk the streets, and I would be like the only black person I would see for a whole week. You know? It was weird to be the only person of color that you ever saw. So if I saw someone that was um, Korean, I was like, yo, yo, what up? You know? And, and they did the same thing. They felt the same way. You know, it wasn't just like, you know, that's a weird dude, you know, I don't know that fool. You know, they were like, I understand what you're going through. You know, because I don't see many of me either up in this piece. So that started to make me think about like, what is welcoming, right? How do we really welcome someone? And then it went back to, Atlanta. Growing up, we would go to my mom and like my, and my brothers and sisters. We would go to like different like you know to the church, and then we'll have the Sunday dinner, the supper at someone's fancy's house sometimes. And you would like open up the door, and you'll see like a pineapple on like the foyer. Was it a foyer or the foyer? I guess it's a foyer when you see that kind of pineapple, <laughs> right? And I, and I asked my mom, "What is that? What is that?" And she was like, "Well, we're gonna have some good fried chicken tonight." Because that means welcoming hospitality. They're going to treat us good. And I was like, what? what? And like, oh, yeah, it's Hawaiian. This is what my mom said. She didn't know. She didn't know. You know, because I didn't know. I did the research while I was in Iowa, and I found out, actually, pineapples are not from Hawaii at all. It's deep, because that's how we're told. The Dog Pineapple Company, company, right? Actually, pineapples never came to Hawaii until eight, 19, 1880. That was the first time it even showed up. And then in 1890, that's when the Dole Pineapple Company started to use that as a way to fantasize and romanticize. Look what we have. We have a pineapple from Hawaii, you know? So where are they really from? They're actually from South America, from Peru and Brazil. And then the indigenous people there moved it to the Caribbean, like Barbados. So during the Enlightenment period, um, King Charles II, he would... Um, bring enslaved Africans to South America and the Caribbean, as well as um, Charleston, South Carolina. Has anybody been to South, um, Charleston? Mm -hmm. And if you notice, what is their logo? That's it's a pineapple awesome. everywhere. You see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, even on their fountains, you see a pineapple. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to start telling you how we get the idea of welcoming. <laughs> so, they will, they will, so once a shipment of enslaved Africans would come to the dock, the four men would run out there and say, oh, man, we got some. Run in there, get a pineapple, and put it on a big spike mm -hmm. to recognize that a new shipment has came. Mm -hmm. That's deep. Mm -hmm. That is how we get the idea of welcoming. Mm -hmm. Because of black bodies. Mm -hmm. That was scary to me. So that made me start to think I really needed to learn about my culture, where I came from, outside of just being 
I'm an African American, you know? So I started recognizing different things that made me think because I'm science, I love science fiction. So when I saw the, um, this OVA here, and those that don't understand, it's just like when we're, when we're learning about um, Rome, and we all know who was the first emperor of Rome, you know, and then we go all the way to the end. We can name all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. We can go to, um, what um, the, what's the last one? Uh, uh, from, Nero? oh yeah, uh, no. Um, Nero? No, not Nero. Not Nero. Um, what's oh, the name? Uh, okay, how come I lost his name right now? But, um, help me out here. But anyway, I, I, can't, I don't know why I can't remember it, but just like, just like that, they have the same thing. They have, they have um, all the kingdoms just the same way, you know? And um, um, so that, that made me think about, like, how do we talk about kingdoms, you know? So this is where I saw. So you see the headdress? Look at the helmet. See the headdress? Look at the helmet. So that made me think about the idea of like these kingdoms can have power, but on the left side, this is what a slave um, um, face mask was. So that king could not even speak. That was messed up, you know. So I created these called True King series that speak to the idea of like comic books giving them hero power, you know. And I felt like this was a way to like bring back all the things that I was learning, right? Without um, making them look like something of, of trauma, but it's looking at power. So then I was like, that's kind of too obvious, because once you see a figure, then you're done, right? So I wanted to start looking at all of the different um, clothing that you would wear and these different rituals. And then I started thinking, what's the opposite during the Enlightenment period, what was that? A colonial um, uh, raffia, I mean, um, um, cl clothing of like um, the, the ruffle shirt, right? Just look at the back, the differences. Mm -hmm. Then I was thinking the ruffle shirt kind of reminds me of, of hair, right? Because it has that same line over line, over line, over line. Then it started me thinking about the music I listened to, the sound waves. Then it was starting to think about water. Why was I caring about water? Because of the land of slave trade, moving human beings from one place to the other, you know? So these were all starting to give me connections. But for me, hair is even more powerful. Um, I was telling some of the students here that I'm a caretaker for my mom. My mom has um, mental health issues, and also now she has Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. But from 2008 to 2017, I was like her main person to take care of. And growing up, when I was younger, she would like pull her hair out. And people would like come to the house and just make fun of us and say like, why are you, why are you having food with hair there? Mm -hmm. And for me, I always stick up for my mom. And that's how I always do when I talk about other people. I always stick up for people. And that hurt me. But then I started realizing, why should it hurt me? I know my mom's safe because that hair is there, you know? So I, I, I took it from a different way. I had no shame no more. I didn't want to live with shame. That's not good to live with shame, right? I don't live, believe in that. I don't believe in living in your shame. Why should I be shameful for my own mom? So that's the reason why I think I take hair so important in the work. Because all those things are bringing all these things together. Man, that got me kind of emotional thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Man. So these are some of the parts that I was um, referencing while I was at Iowa. As you can see, these parts are from Burkina Faso. And you can start to see where I'm coming from in the word. Now you're starting to realize, like, why do I make these kind of um, bulbous shapes? And um, for, for them, I'm going okay, to break it down. So traditional, we're not talking about anyone can do what you want, but traditional, you know, pots are made with um, 
Men will bring the pots and bring the clay to the women. Okay? This is powerful. And then the women will be making these coil pots. And I love that because that's how I learned how to make these pots, through seeing how they make these coils and, and then make a pinch and then coil make a pinch. And they're doing this meditation and quickly doing that pinch, moving up, moving up, to the point that sometimes they have um, um, paddles, so they'll start to paddle it forward, holding inside. It's just like if you were having a um, um, wheel, but they don't use a wheel, which I also think is powerful too. So a lot of the um, forms are representation of, of power, fertility, but not just fertility for um, a woman, but also for the community, for the food that they're about to eat, for the people's um, spiritual um, fruit. And I thought that that was even powerful. How come I can't have a life that is fruitful? How come you can't see me as a fruitful person? You just see me as a black man, and then, you know, if something bad happened, oh, man, you know, you, you died. Let's rally around you now, you know? How come you can't rally around me when everything's fine? We don't ever think about that, do we? You know? We only see one or the other. How come it can't be all things? I mean, right? Or are we just, like, going to just be quiet about that, you know? If we're in this, in this place together, we should be able to feel that resonance. And that's what I saw in these pots, that resonance and that mark making. If you see the, the one in the, the right, the, line, the lines are very reminiscent of the same lines that I did. Because each line, you become one with that pot. So when you become one with that pot, what were you becoming? You're becoming that you know that pot, right? So I took that same idea and think, wow, if I do that same kind of form, I should be doing that in the same way how I talk to one of each person I meet. I should treat somebody just like I want to be treated. Slowly understanding them, getting to know them, not just being like one and done or trying to figure you out. You know, I don't do that when I make my work. As Alexander said, I don't stop until it's finished. So I completely know it. So, some ideas that was coming from that. I saw this um, Joel of people dwellers in synagogue and Gambia. And I thought, this is powerful because they have this whole community of different sizes of these dwellings. And that, so that started to make me think, like, what if I made works that were not just the same size all the time? That they played on each other. They, they worked with each other. Because it's just like these compounds, they were used as a way to bring people together. So why not, how come I can't do the same thing in my work? So lastly, why not? I was also thinking about the Boa people of Burkina Faso, where my ancestry is from. And as you can see, the, um, the raffia on those um, clothings of the ritual is so like deep and strong and like rough and raw, coming from another place. So I was thinking that's also a powerful way to speak about bringing something from environment into to, to the to the community. But also they have these plank masks, and the checkerboard plank mass is a representation of, of life. So, and the culture is white is the color of death. The color black is a representation of enlightenment. And that's something that we never hear all the time. We always hear in Western culture that white is purity. Correct? No. You know? And so I was like, man, all this time other cultures don't think the same way as us. I mean, of course that sounds... Like, that shouldn't be obvious. That should, that's, you should know better. But we don't think better. I mean, you know, we do not think better. Let's be real. Every time we talk about stuff, we always talk about stuff in that way. We never look at work from other countries and think they have a different world view. We always think we shouldn't put our world view on them. So the other one has a zigzag pattern, and it kind of even looks like a mountain because that triangle. So it's like a concept of the snake, and the snake is what happened. <coughs> what created the earth. And also it speaks to the way how you live your life. So you go up the mountain and you give knowledge. You, you learn knowledge and then you bring it back to your people. And then you do the same thing back and forth. But it's also about how life is. There's some ups and then there's some downs. You're never like always going to be stagnant. Sometimes things are going to be really good. Sometimes things are going to be really messed up. So how do you do that? Because the same thing as you're going up, you're becoming a teacher. 
I mean, you're becoming a student. And then when you come down, you become a teacher, right? So that's how we should live our lives in everything we do. I've learned a lot from the students here, but I was supposed to be the visiting artist teaching someone, right? You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm going to give um, both at the same time. And I feel that that's what the, um, the Wellens trying to do. They have knowledge because they have a, a vast amount of art here. But they're also excited about how the students or how people who visit this museum is bringing their in information to that work at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're being both. So now, haha, there's me. <laughs> <laughs> so this was in Township 10, um, residency I did in Marshall, North Carolina. And I love this place. And this is kind of shows you like how I make my work. And um, as you can see, the clay is like a brownish red, right? Mm -hmm. So, but if you have been to the, you know, which I know all you have, saw the work at the <laughs> downstairs, so you know that it may be black or darkish brown, right? Mm -hmm. So now you're starting to know how I make the work. And even though you can't see it in my hands doing this, it's just a, a needle tool that I have that I just make one mark at a time. Mm -hmm. So this is how I make the work. Okay, so now we're going to start a little bit about how I come up with forms. Because everyone's been actually like, oh, you must make, you know, black forms. I'm like, no, I actually make my forms coming from robots and droids. <laughs> <laughs> because I felt like, why would, if I do that, then I'm, once again, if I'm making black bodies, then I'm actually doing something wrong again. I'm, I'm taking, a, taking my own place and, and, and saying that I am bad again. I'm oppressing myself. So I'm trying to speak about something better that how, how come we can't look at all bodies as something beautiful, you know? Not just, not talking about myself all the time. I want these pieces to be like, yes, it is about blackness, but it also, anyone can understand this. How come I can't say that? How come I can't say that my work is about humanity all the time? True? Yeah. You know? So that's what I wanted to do in the work. So you kind of can see, like, even with the piece um, protector, it kind of has that look like this. And also, like I said, I'm a you know, science fiction nerd, you know, so Doctor Who. And Daleks are the um, antagonist in the longest running show in the world of TV. And I thought this was powerful, too, because it also brought me back to, like, those bulbous shapes. Those boba ships that I saw, those amazing Burkina Faso pots and pots from Ghana had, you know? And it made me think about the idea of, like, you know, fertility and, and fruitfulness versus these um, dogs were like, exterminate, 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 exterminate. <laughs> so why do I think I'm making a connection there? Because they thought that they, their, their world, they can go to time and space and destroy other worlds. So I'm saying that they thought they were fruitful by destroying. I'm saying that I can be fruitful for bringing people together. Once again, a new connection that no one ever thought of. Smooth, smooth, smooth. <laughs> so lastly on that, uh, <laughs> I don't want to you know, show off too much. But um, the stress ball. So I was thinking about we all go through stress. And so that made me think about those same boba shapes, you know. Very similar, when you have stress inside. So when I say that my work is, in, is speaking about alluding to the black body, everyone just automatically thinks, oh, you're talking about the outer body. I, I get it, yeah, yeah. No. I'm really talking about the inner body. Mm -hmm. The body that once you go through something, what do you do? You internalize those things, don't you? And then it comes out. You don't just like, someone says something bad and you just, oh. You think about it first and then your body does it. You don't even know your body's making that weird move, right? It's just coming because of what you're internalizing inside you. So that's the reason why I see them in, in that way. And then lastly, um, I'm thinking about Legos. Because yes, I do love Legos. And if I had a, a bigger house, I would have a whole room of Legos. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wish I did, you know? And so, there, I'm thinking about the idea of, of, of building worlds. And how do you build a world uh, that is better? If you need the first, what you need to do first is build that world inside. 
So each object that I'm creating, I'm creating an object that is making a new world for you. So once you make that world inside you, you can bring that out to, to anyone else. That's the reason why we keep having these same problems all the time. Because we think that all we gotta do is just get new people in there, right? You know, that's all we gotta do, right? Just, just break that, get new people. But we need to get people that have already understood and love themselves first. So they can actually think about, oh, you know who we're forgetting? We're forgetting this person, we're forgetting this person. You know, um, how come we don't have um, this, this person, um, they can do this. And then that's when you realize that you have a board that's all the same people again. Mm -hmm. Not one person black, not one person is LGBTQ, not one person that is Korean, not one person that is indigenous. And then you're like, how did that happen? We thought that we had changed because we didn't start by working with ourselves first. We just go back to the same thing over. It keeps happening every five years. We get a new board and we realize um, we only got one black person on there again. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. Don't, haven't we seen that? Mm -hmm. We're in 2023 and we're still talking about, you know, police problems. So here's the first piece. Finally, we got to art. Yay! <laughs> He's like, man, he was talking a lot. <laughs> so this is like the first piece I ever made in this whole kind of concept. And when I was first making this, it was real deep about somehow the people were thinking about this work, you know. And I just had to make it, regardless of what people were thinking, you know. I had a lot of people in my grad program was like, I don't understand what you're doing, you know. And that's one thing I want to say since you're a student here. You can do whatever you want with your work. If you believe in, and have the research and the knowledge and the, and, and the understanding of what you're making, you can really push those things. Just because somebody in your class doesn't understand what you're making at the time doesn't mean it's not good. It just means they don't, they don't understand because they don't have the same experience. You know? And so that's when you can either choose to be like, well, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm just going to do what they said because they didn't think it was tight. Or you can say, I want to explore it better. Maybe it's, it's on the right track, but I could do more to it. I need to know more about what I'm thinking about. I need to look into myself. Where is this coming from? and really open up and be okay to be vulnerable. I'm very vulnerable, as you can see. I mess up, I do good, do bad, you know, you know, but I'm still going through this whole talk, you know, because, you know, everyone gets nervous. But it's, like, powerful how you can see my humanity, right? Don't you see my humanity? Yeah. And that's what we want when I make my work. I don't ever be fake and phony. I walk around Hamilton, everyone is going to see that I'm not going to be changing how I act. Maybe it was good to see so many people that I've had interactions with here today. So this piece, Dolly. So now, it made me think about like, okay, how can I make something that is traumatic? All those things I talked about, about the pineapple, living your life, walking streets, and, and feeling like you don't, shouldn't be there. And I was like, why am I thinking like that, first of all? This is about welcoming. We're all human beings. So I don't have to feel like I need to belong. I already do belong. This is a deeper idea. So what I need to do is just create how to teach people how to be welcoming. Instead of like, oh, we're so glad you're here. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> and anything. So I made this piece thinking about how we could do that. So it kind of also kind of looks like a insect alien in a way too. Because I also wanted to make it feel like it's okay to be different. It's okay to not have the, the, the beauty standards or, or, or any of those kind of things that we expect that everyone's supposed to have, you know? Also, I wanted to also kind of look like a fruit because it kind of has like a fruit um, um, stems coming out of it as well, right? So it's like it's like the abundance, like you can pick one of those bulbous shapes off of it each time. So that means that each time you're getting one, you're also getting more strength. Which is completely opposite of what the Dalek was, right? Now this one is a, a real one for me. It's called Clapback. Love that, right? Love that title, huh? Okay, let me tell you about that kind of title, where it came from. And if you notice, it looks like, like a stomach just going like, ah, like getting you know, gut punch, right? Doesn't it look like that? Okay. All right, so I'm going to tell you a, a little real story. I had told this today in one of the classes, but it was real. This is, you know, and when the first time I showed any of this kind of work, my first critique, 
in 2017 at the University of Iowa. And I was telling them that this is about the pineapple and things. The first thing they said, some, well, three people said this. Why are you appropriating pineapples? You're not Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. You're not Hawaiian. You should be making watermelons. No. That's what they told me. And this is 2017. This is my cohort saying this. What do you do when you're like the only person of color and then one other person of color in there you see crying that someone's saying this and no one said anything in the room? And there was a professor in the room and no one said nothing. One person put their hand up, which is weird. They put their hand up. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so the professor didn't do anything. I was like, okay. And he was like, so you're telling me that he can't do this because he's black? And then someone said, be quiet, be quiet. <laughs> so somebody actually was trying to do the right thing in there. And they were told to shut up. Mm -hmm. This is happening in 2017. So I know this might be happening in 2023. And I hope it's not, but I know it probably is, because people are shaking their heads <laughs> up in here. Those who don't know Zoom, they're shaking their head up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, this hurt. That like, how come I didn't do a clap back? That was something that I had to learn. Like, I should have said something back. That was why when I spoke about this in that class, no one said nothing. Mm -hmm. It was like, huh, huh? And I was like, are you serious? You didn't even feel that, what I just said? It was because like, they were thinking like, huh? Maybe they didn't think I even said it. So that's the reason why like, I bring it up now. Because this is an opportunity. When you hear something crazy, what you should do? What should you do? Right. You should, you should clap back and say something immediately. Because you know what happens when you don't? You, everyone heard it, and then come, somebody comes after it, the whole thing's over. Yo, man, I'm going to get you a beer. You know, it was messed up what happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it was messed up. Well, where, well, you messed up, too, because you didn't even say nothing. You just let me just look crazy up in that piece. Why I got to be the one looking crazy? Mm -hmm. You know? It should have been everyone um, um, rallying around me. Instead of, you know, it's not about, like, this and the person that said it. It's about, like, hey, that ain't cool. Why are we talking like that? You know, this is not even about the art anymore. That is why I'm bringing this up, because I feel like this is so important, because we, this keeps happening all the time. There's a reason why we have boardrooms, and we hear stuff, and uh, uh, someone says something terrible about a woman in there, and no one says nothing. Mm -hmm. And then after the fact, we come, oh, man, you know, I can't believe. Why? Why are, we, why are we fearful if we're doing the right thing? I know this is something that's deep, and I see people shaking their head, but this is something real to me. This is something that now I, I never um, not stop. I always completely stop it. I always go, nope, we're going to talk about that real fast, and then we, we'll keep it moving. I bring that up because I've seen it even even happening even here. There's something like that happen here. And I don't want that to happen to another person here. So, now we're going to have some fun. I did a whole show at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, called Cheat Code. I mean, I'm called um, Object of Tomorrow. And it was all based on the whole album, Cheat Code. Has anybody heard this album? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's so good, right? So, <laughs> so here's what the um, piece called Cheat Code looked like. And when I was making this piece, I was thinking about, like, you know when you're working out and you have, like, those, those kettlebells? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it kind of look like one of those kettlebells? <laughs> and I make all my titles after the fact. So it's not like, I'm going to make a kettlebell today. I'm going to be so cool, make a kettlebell. <laughs> I'm listening to Black Thought, you know? Nah, I was like, oh, man. I was rock vibing off of what was going on in that album, and that created that on its own. So then I started thinking, it looks like a kettlebell as well is it looks like a lock. Mm -hmm. And it started to make me think that maybe I'm trying to unlock something that's inside me, that I can't be afraid to open up and be vulnerable and mess up, you know, because someone's going to say, oh, you don't even know that, you know. I don't care. I know it, but, you know, everybody goes through stuff, you know. So that makes you feel like a human being when you mess up and you can own up to it and move on. So just like, I've been eating a lot here. I got big. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I need that kettle. That kettle. See? I can laugh. 
because I'm talking about all these things in my art. You know, say, so isn't that beautiful when you can talk about something that's deep as well as talking something about something funny? You can talk about something that is um, about music. And I did it, and I'm black, and I didn't say one thing about being black in this. Isn't that deep? So that's why I want to hear when um, I, I go to a show. I don't want to say here every time that I make something, oh man, it's about blackness. Man, it's tight. Mm -hmm. No, what happened? That's about black thought. You know what I'm saying? Or what about that's MF Doom? You know what I mean? Things of that nature, right? That's cool. Instead of hearing that all the time. You know, I want someone to say, isn't that a cool, interesting form? Abstraction. So this is what the piece looked like. All together. Just one room with a long table. And that kind of brought me back thinking about the, um, the dwellings of Jola, dwellings of the idea of they have different sizes, how they all resonate with one another. So that's what I was thinking about when I made this whole um, concept for the show. And then all you have to do is let be quiet and just listen to them. Because one of them may talk to you while they're talking to each other, correct? This is what it looks like close up. Nice, take the picture. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this piece here, I said reboot, but it's actually a matrix. Um, but yeah, so when I was making this piece, does anyone know what the word matrix means? In Latin? Does anyone know what matrix means in Latin? It means womb. Yeah. And I'm a printmaker. So I was thinking about the matrix of like a matrix is something that you create and then you can make multiples from, correct? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what can I do to make multiples up? I thought it would be powerful if I made something that looks like a basket that every time you pull it out, you get something new out of it every time. Every time you get something new out of it every time. But also, every time I say something, someone else is getting resonated, and they can bring it to the next person. That's like I'm becoming a matrix. My body has become a matrix. Isn't that deep? Mm -hmm. And can't everyone become a matrix? If we all say, from here, I've made multiples of people because they heard me talk this, all this stuff today. Mm -hmm. And then you go somewhere, and you bring up, man, Dante was crazy, he messed up, but he also said some real shit, <laughs> you know? And then you bring that to the next person, right? Ain't that powerful? Yeah. Yes. I love that feeling. Mm -hmm. When you actually can bring something that you put in your mind, make something, made a matrix, and then you can continue it doing it over and over and over through, the, through one object. That's what I was thinking about when I made that piece. So this is what Reboot is. I don't know how I messed up, missed that one. But anyway, Reboot is an um, idea that I was thinking from that matrix, right? Let's flip it. What happens on a computer? What happens on a computer when things get messed up? You have to reboot it, right? And then what happens when you reboot? You know what happens with me? It don't work better. It gets, it gets messed up, right? It's like, it goes slower and slower and slower, right? It doesn't work right. I, and it's like, why did I have to reboot this? Sometimes like when someone says, oh man, you got your phone and it has you know, installed the next thing, I don't want to do it. Because if it does, it probably going to mess up this iPhone and going to make me buy a new one, right? <laughs> so that's what I was thinking about when I made this piece. I was like, oh man, reboot, this is deep. You can actually think about that in a lot of ways. Right now, what we're going through with you know, all the changes in different museums is the reboot. Right? Are they going to um, reboot to like be worse? Are they going <laughs> to, I'm, I'm being real, think, I know it's funny, but it, it, that could happen. Or are they going to improve? That's what I was thinking about when I made that piece. So now, we're talking about the museum, this is where I was in April 2022. Looking smooth. <laughs> so all of the ideas in the show um, and the commission was based on the baskets here. And so this is what um, some of the great um, work that I was making and having great conversations with Janelle. And I want to thank you for documenting all these great things. And so now you can see what it looks like when it's um, drying. Mm -hmm. you know, so now you actually can see what it looks like when they're also like in process. So on the left side is when it's actually finished drying. It's just drying. It hasn't been fired. It's been drying. 
the one on the right, you see how kind of dark is brown it is? So then you're starting to see the layers of color and how they change. So you see from the left, you can see how dark it was at first. And then once it's dry, how lighter it got. So now you're starting to see the process of how, and that took five days to dry. And then a beautiful picture of the candles you have here. Thank you, Professor Rebecca. <laughs> awesome. You know, come on. Come on, right? <laughs> and we made sure we cleaned it out, too. <laughs> so, uh, I know, right? So now, this is what it looks like when it's finished, you know, for those who are on Zoom. Um, so this piece here is called Elevators. And this is like one of the, my, this was my favorite piece in the, in the grouping that I made. Yes, I admit it. I, I do like, you know, ones that better than the others. I admit that as artists, all artists, sometimes we like some more than others. We shouldn't say that because then somebody might say, I like that one better. Like, oh, please, you like that? I like that one too. That's what ends up happening. You know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, they like that one? I'm going to say I like that too. But I'm being honest, I like this one um, as my, well, it's my favorite. And it's coming from that basket that, um, I think, you know, I think it's your back. Yep, yep, here it is. And like I said, I always make all the pictures um, after. I draw them after. So if you notice on the basket drawing on the top um, right, it has like this, um, these gra great graphic lines, almost as if it looks like different like ladders and elevators. Right? Mm -hmm. So I took that as my inspiration. And it made me think of a lot of things. Because first of all, during that time, April 2022, I was thinking about what does baskets do? What do you hold into a basket? Mm -hmm. You have food, you have um, blankets you put in there. Sometimes um, cats and dogs are inside, <laughs> right? All these things are familiar and something that's um, beautiful and loving that you want to hold and caress, you know? But also um, for um, the United people, the idea of a basket is a welcoming for a new home. And I felt like all this artwork that I was making was going to a new museum home, right? Deep, I know, I have connections all over the place. I always think like that. But also I love hip hop. So it made me think of those different like graphic elevator lines. It made me think of um, Outkast's song, Elevators. Mm -hmm. And the idea of like when people talk about how people are moving up in the world, you know? And in, the, in one of the um, verses is like talking about, like, I did all these things and then like everyone thinks I'm like living great, but I'm just, just like everybody else. You know, struggling. Just because you heard my song on the radio doesn't mean I'm rich and you need to give me, I'm supposed to give you some money from like cousins and aunties I never heard of. You know, I'm just like you, struggling. You know, so, but then it also reminded me of the opportunity, what this museum can do. It can elevate culture. It also can elevate how we think about the works in this museum. Also can make you think about how you can elevate yourself. So this piece here is from the collection. It was another um, powerful piece that I really liked. And it was like one of the um, terracotta um, pieces from Maria uh, Martinez. And this piece really spoke to me about the idea of how we can travel through, through worlds. So it made me think of trace. That's why I call it the trace. Because like, we're going through worlds, you know, each every day when we're looking at these museums. You know, because right now it's the present. But soon, this work will also be, future people are going to be seeing this present day lifetime that we had, mm -hmm. you know, in 2023. You know, and we're going to trace back of all those things that we went through during 2023, this 10 year anniversary, right? Mm -hmm. And like, man, what's happened in those 10 years since this um, museum has been going on? Some crazy stuff happened. Mm -hmm. We're tracing that right now, aren't we? So what happens when the next 10 years happen? And the next year happens. We're going to be tracing a new contemporary way of living, right? For the next group. This here piece is called Drum. And this was coming from the idea of the carry cases that you see when you come up here. If you notice how like all of them have like the same kind of rectangular box and then they have the great artwork inside those glass cases. Mm -hmm. So that made me start thinking about how these pieces will be inside there too. So even the way it's made even looks like those carry-on case glass. So I was also thinking about the idea of if you flip that over, it'll look like an African drum. Yeah. 
the rhythm that you get when you see an object together. It's powerful when you see another object next to another object, right? And I wanted to like show that when we look at something, it makes you want to believe like, man, look what I'm doing here. Look what I'm here. Look what I see here. Look what I'm seeing there. I feel that and I want to be a part of something greater than myself. So this is the um, drawing um, field guide that I made for me. So you can kind of see like how I was thinking about how the architecture kind of works with it. This piece here is called Defender. And this is one of the um, pieces that I like to talk about um, closer to the end of a presentation. Because we have to defend one another. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in this world and a lot of things that we see just walking the streets of, of Clinton. Are we going to um, allow to be, are we going to do the clap back? Or, or, or are we going to say nothing? Or are we going to defend what we believe is right? You know? Are you going to defend your friends when you hear someone talk bad about something? Or are you just going to say nothing and then not defend even the things that you believe in? I live like that all the time in my life. Yes, it is, it is you might think it's draining, but it's not draining. You know why? Anyone want to ask me? Do you know why? why? Because I'm a human, mm -hmm. and I love all the people here. And if I say that I want to be a better person, I should want to help anyone who doesn't look like me or think like me, you know, because we have something together that we can make. And I will defend anyone to do the right thing. So what here is called Behold, and this is like a fun piece for me. Because it's like the idea of, oh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it has to have the bravado, you know? You gotta be like, uh, uh, uh. So, like, <laughs> so on the top, it has like the, the flatness that reminds me of like the Legos. So, if like all my pieces, as you flip them over, they would be, they're hollow, so it's like a vessel, you know? So, I'm thinking about the idea that the body is a vessel. But these are um, not a vessel for food, it's for the mind and soul. So behold, you're here. You ain't going nowhere. And protector. Right? Yeah. It's time to protect what's going on in this community, you know, as well as protecting what's going on in this museum. You know? If we're really going to believe what's going on, that this can't happen, there was something called January 6th. Right? Yep. There was something called January 6th. Look how easily protection could have been you know? And why did it take, um, I mean, no offense, black people always knew this could happen. Mm -hmm. We've already been like that. Yeah, I'm just keeping it real, you know? Why, why did it take that for you guys to figure out? Mm -hmm. You know, that it's time to protect what we really believe is right. So now I'm going to end you with something fun because I love um, comic books. And Green Lantern is like one of the, my favorite comic book characters. And Jon Stewart was like the first um, black Green Lantern. And I went, when I went to my very first um, residency, they were like, you need to make sure you bring a flashlight. You know, it's going to be dark here. And I was like, my man, I got a flashlight, I got this thing, come on. This is $800, it's a good flashlight. <laughs> right? So when they said it was black, it was black. It took me like, okay, so from the main office to where my studio space was, it was like five minutes. Okay. It took me 20 minutes to get there. <laughs> I got lost. I came around, and then I ended up bumping into the house when I finally saw it. It was crazy. It was so embarrassing. So the next day, I drove 15 minutes away to the, to the Walmart just to get a, a light. <laughs> but I, I bring this up because that was deep to me. And, th and I made this piece called Lantern. I feel like this is like one of my stronger pieces. And it made me think like, I was in the dark, thinking about these kind of ideas all the time, because I made this in 2020. You know, it was my very first time ever going to a residency, and this was like, you know, COVID world, everyone had their mask on, you know, and, and it was like, I'm thinking about these ideas of like trying to make objects that are deeper than myself. Does anyone give up mm -hmm. that I'm doing this? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I'm actually thinking about something deeper than myself. Stuff that when people see my work, they assume that it means this, when I'm not actually thinking that, because that's not who I am. However, that is who I am because I love everyone. You know? I put everything in my work. I think about all people in my work. 
And so, like, will people get that? Why should I even be making art? You know? So that's the reason why I made this flip, um, um, piece called Lantern. And you were like, well, it's black. It's dark. But going back to what I said about the colors, this black is illuminating. Mm -hmm. Can I bring light to something? Something light that's more powerful than just myself and the people in this room that we can actually do something. All the time we say that, oh, man, you're talking about utopia, man. That's coming out bullshit. Right? No, it's not. You know why? Because, like I said, I only have like 20 friends. But all 20 of my friends are feeling what I feel. And, they're, and those who I don't know feel what I feel. And sometimes it doesn't work, you know, because, like, we internalize things and we mess up. I mess up all the time, too. But every time I have integrity and I go back to that, like, I mean, I messed up, you know, and I keep it real. So I believe we can all have an illumination. We can all have our own Green Lantern light. If we really believe we can change things, we really can. And with that, thank you. much any questions or comments or was so was I so good <laughs> you know come on right okay yes Hi. yeah <laughs> I wanted to ask you talked a lot about like mm -hmm. finding your ancestry and working through that with art mm. do you feel like it was your desire to learn more about your ancestry that led you to doing art Mm. Or was art just already there, mm. and you kind of just incorporated ancestry into it? That's great. Mm. I always, okay, this is, this is real. We're going to talk real again. That's all the way I can do it. You know, this is kind of embarrassing, so mom, if you're listening. She, okay, this is, this is the reason why she named me Dante. You know, it's because um, she had a vision that I was going to be an artist and do things that no one thought would be possible. So she was like, I'm going to name him Dante. That's like one of my favorite artists. So that's the reason why my name is Dante. So she kind of made me be an artist. You know? Like, I didn't want no crayon. She was like, no, put that crayon on your hand. You're an artist! <laughs> yeah? Seriously. No lie, no joke. I, I didn't even care. She like, made me. You know? So at first, I didn't really want to be an artist myself. But then I was like, maybe she was right, because I was actually good at drawing. You know what I mean? So maybe she did have a vision. So like, even though, it was just deep, because like, she created something in me. You know what I mean? She created a world inside me that I didn't even know I had. Because she said that that's who I was. You know? This is deep stuff. You know? And like, I didn't really never really talk about that until like, you know, today. Because like, I just totally talk real. And like, you asked me that question, and like, it was like, damn. You know? So like, this is the reason why I like this school, because I've been asked real questions here, mm. or have real conversations. No offense to other like um, places where I've been. I mean, I'm being honest, I mean, because I'm saying this on Zoom, so <coughs> someone's going to hear this. So I ain't scared. I ain't scared. Right? So I can say this and not lie, because I ain't lying. Like, I actually had the best um, interview I've ever had from the docents here, and Margie was there. It was powerful. I said stuff that I never talked about because no one ever asked me these kind of questions. And how come? If they did, they would really understand what my work is speaking about. You know? So I thank you for that. Yeah, my, yes, it was my mom. It's the reason why I make art. Mm -hmm. and, but now I do it because I actually believe I actually am a good artist, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, not think I am, you know? Like Yoda knows. I, you know, I know Yoda. Come on. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Great question. Yes, yes. Uh, right now? Oh, thanks, you know? <laughs> so, why are you trying to hate on my outcast? You know what I'm saying? My biggie? Come on. Nas? You know, I know it's old school. Honestly. <laughs> Black Dog's too old now? Damn. Okay, let me see. Um, Run the Jewels? I love me some Run the Jewels. That's too, that too old? I uh, know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I love me some Run the Jewels, so that's, that's what I've been listening to lately. Yeah. So tell me what you like then. Because you're hating on my my, <laughs> my choices. <laughs> I don't really think I listen to that much rap. Okay, okay. I mean like I listen to old stuff too. But oh thank you. Now, now you're telling the truth. You're hating on me first, now you're gonna bring it back. What? What? 
<laughs> that hurt. Come on now. Okay, what's next? Anybody on Zoom? Not yet. Okay, cool, cool. So I guess I was doing good then. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you say you're a print maker yep. as yep. well as you were with ceramics. Um, the print that you showed. Okay. That was yours? And yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't show nobody else's and I without saying, oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't try to jump you now. No, no, you're good. <laughs> but it, it looked like it was like woodcut. Oh, oh yeah. What it, kind of like, it was a lonely and black fountain. Oh, okay, gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. What kind of like materials do you use? Like, is there a specific reason you use the materials that you do? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, very much so. Because, first of all, I have a background in printmaking, but I really like etching. And with etching, it's like the copper, but for those who don't know, I'm just assuming that, you know, we all know now. It's like a copper plate or like a aluminum plate, and you have a needle tool, and you make marks onto the um, metal. And that's what I'm kind of doing with the clay. I'm making marks, you know, those slow, you know, those, you know, not cross hatching, but like hatching marks. Yeah. You know, just like, and I'm doing it just like how you would draw. So you like hatch, 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 to make it look like it's round. You know, when you take the first, you know, drawing one class, you try to make it look round. That's what I'm doing. But 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 I'm so I'm following the form that it's making, right? So reason why I even work in clay is because of the content he's giving me. When people in um, Professor Amy's class was like, "Why are you working clay? And why do you don't glaze?" And I told, and I was like, "That's what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to glaze." <laughs> See? Right? And Rebecca knows about that, you know, like, we, that happens all the time in ceramics, about this idea you have to have glaze. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Those who work with um, ceramics and they glaze, you can hide things with glaze. <laughs> right? You can hide a lot of things, you know, with glaze. You can't hide nothing how I make my work. Just like how you, I ain't hiding nothing, you know? I have no filter with that, you know, I'm just being me, you know? And that's a powerful thing with content, when you have no thing on top. Isn't it powerful to live in a world when you don't have a mask? Mm -hmm. And that's what I, how I live my life. I live with no mask. While other people are wearing masks and sometimes they have to pretend stuff, I don't pretend. You know? And that's why I went in my art. So that's when you see the work and it's done, you're like, damn, he was like, took his time because there's no cracks. I don't even open up the kiln to 125. And most ceramic people are laughing, because like, who does that anymore? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Because like, we got, we got to open it up. We got to open it up. But I'm, even, I'm leaving like that. From even to the time that I even uh, work in the kiln, I wait, because I'm speaking about content and everything. That's the reason why the um, work is like, the, um, um, when it's fired, it turns black, because that begins content. Once again, I'm saying that the material itself is the power, is the illumination, not me putting something on top of it. So then yeah. follow up to that, mm -hmm. when you do have like ceramic pieces that you put in to the kiln, do you ever have an instance where it does crack or it does break? And like, if so, how do you go about kind of addressing the piece mm. in that way? Do you scrap it? Yes. Do you make it work? Okay, that, that only happened twice yeah and for the first time I ever okay so when I, when I make some works and I want to make it look like a different range of black I use a different you know I use mason stain so I have a percentage that I know when I wedge it in the clay of how much um, weight of this that I know how dark it's gonna end up getting I didn't do a good job wedging this time okay being see like I said I make mistakes and I'm telling you you know everything and when it got fired, you saw everything looking perfect. And there was like one little mark that was like lighter than the, everything else when it fired. Usually I would have said, and just smashed it. <laughs> this time it was in that show. And I called it blemish. Because we all have blemishes. And why did I say that thing was ugly? It's not. It's beautiful as it is. That made me learn something. That why did I um, break that other one? You know? Yeah. Question from, from Zoom. Oh, yeah, by the way, it was it, it's Constantine. Constantine. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, I, that's why I couldn't remember that. I was like, I was so embarrassed. And Augustus is the first. Like, 
Now I can remember because I'm, I'm relaxed now. <laughs> that hurt. I was like, damn, I know this stuff and I can't even say it. I had to keep it real though, so I remembered though. Okay, question for you. <laughs> I love this. This is awesome. <laughs> Mm. Since your childhood, and mm. affected you during that change? Oh man, it's, so, it's, it's amazing now. There's so many more shows. You know what I mean? It's like so cool to see like so many people that are black in the future. I mean, I already knew that, but seeing it on TV is different. Mm -hmm. You know, I can watch Netflix all the way to the Hulu. It's, it's great. But not just seeing black people, all people. You know, that's the new Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery. You see LGBTQ people in there. It's amazing. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I like that kind of stuff because like it was awesome to see everybody there. Because that's how I think about everything I think about is always about who is in this circle. I know that's weird. Some people don't think like that, but I do. I always think about who is around me. I want to make sure I, I'm around good people and all people can be good if we want to be. If we put our effort in it, right? So I feel like actually in that way it's actually been better because I could just name you like only two people back in the day. I remember back in the day, I remember when we were like, oh man, Gaina, you know what I'm saying, Whoopi Goldberg, she's whack. You know, we used to say that kind of stuff. We want somebody cooler. Yeah, I'm keeping her old. Yep, yeah, I'm saying it. You know? So, but like now there's so many different people to like be like, yeah, right? So great. I'm glad someone asked that question. Okay. So, um, you mentioned you go through like extensive periods mm -hmm. of research. At what point do you realize like your research is complete and, mm. or maybe not complete, Ooh. but you're ready to start? Ooh. Oh, oh, oh. See what I'm telling you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, I wouldn't be able to get into this school. <laughs> oh, damn, you guys are too smart. This kind of hurts. No, no, no. I'm giving you props. But yeah, so, okay, so when, okay, once again, we're going to keep it real. We're going to talk about Hamilton, and we're going to talk about how I even got here. This thing all started back in November of 2021. Think about this. This is the first time I talked to Tracy, Alexander, and Liz, and, and, my, um, and Mindy, who um, represents my artwork. And that was the first time we introduced each other. It was in Zoom, of course. You know how it was back then. And I was making a commission for another museum. And they were actually able to see it because it was like in the space that I was at. So they could see the scale, and, and I could talk about the work and explain where it's coming from. And we had an amazing conversation. It was supposed to have been only for like an hour, ended up going a lot longer, because we didn't realize how long it was. We just kept talking, because like, there were so many great conversations happening. So that's when it was like, OK, so we were like, OK, let's think about, we can do this idea. We can do this. So I said, um, is it possible so I can get a PDF of all the images of the, that's in the collection at that time? And stuff. So I got that in November. So December, um, I had Christmas and New Year's. So I didn't look at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just keeping it around. So, <laughs> so in January is when I did a full look, you know, mm -hmm. and looked really strong about all the works and thought about it, things that was going on in my own life. Like I said, I was we built my wife and I building that house, and then it was like April came is when the first time I came here. But it was during your school, your your um, your break, spring break. I missed everybody here. And it, but it was like day before, it was like blizzard. It was like crazy in April, you know. <laughs> so that's when I said, "This is what I want to see. I would like to see your baskets." And and everyone was like, "What baskets? We look at all these great works we have, you know? Like, why do you want the baskets?" And I was like, "Oh no, I have a good reason." And then they were like, "Oh man, that's deep." That was like that was like powerful. We, that's what we want. That's what we need to bring all these things together. And so I came. So I came to look all around the different parts of the school and meet the different um, professors. And then I got to um, meet Rebecca, which was awesome. And I didn't ask hardly any questions. And I know um, Alexander and Tracy were kind of worried because I didn't ask no questions. Mm -hmm. You know, because I know Tracy. I know her face. She's like, Dante ain't asking nothing. <laughs> I don't know why, but I did ask a question. And it was to Rebecca. And she was like, do you have any questions? I was like, I do. Um, I'm going to be doing a commission. And at the time, the commission was to make one piece. And I said, well, is it possible? Can I make this commission here on this grounds? 
And Rebecca was like, damn, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's try to figure out how to make that happen. Isn't that powerful what this school can do? Isn't that powerful what your school can do? Yeah. No one never did this before, a residency like this. It was just because that was the only question I asked. That means I was at thinking, like, what should I ask? I don't just ask questions just to ask questions so I can look performative and look cool, you know? I ask questions that are meaningful. And I was so thankful that Rebecca was, was in like, oh, no, we don't do that. It was like, let's try to make that happen. Alexander, isn't that a good idea? Alexander, like, Alexander's always smooth. He's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you doing it now, look. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so that's how it happened. You know? So, and <laughs> this is great. So in June, right? So I come back in June. Everything is like just me in there. And, and Janelle will come in. So I'm gonna tell you a little thing about how I work. Um, like as Alexander said, I, I work for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I usually work 16 hour days. So I was able to have a card to get into access into the room. So I would get there at two in the morning to start making work. I was only here for four, four full nights. And I finished six works in four days. Wow. Those same size, those are the pieces. Mm -hmm. And I did that here. That shows you like the facilities you have are great. You know, and I had great conversations with Janelle, and we were talking about real issues during it. And many of the facilities people that, you know, you know, help and make the place beautiful, I had great conversations with them. You know, it was an awesome feeling when they were coming with Dante's in. Man, you know, man, you made another one tonight? It's like great, right? They, they were shocked at how many I could make in this four, you know, in four days, four full days. So I said, I'll come back in a couple weeks. Because everything will be dry by then, and I had other things to do too, and I wanted to make sure I got back before. Well, it was it did, everything was done, so we moved it inside the kiln room, and then the, you guys had a group coming in to do some um, make work here. So I would just you know when I came back in July, I just like you know had help with um, John and Brian, and we helped you know put the work in the kilns, and then I did my program, and then I had a nice time in Utica. <laughs> and then I come back and then I fire another one and then hey, I had a nice time in Utica. And then I did it one more time and then from there everything came up perfect. Everything was perfect. You know? No no problems with the work. And that's when I said I like to draw them on. Like, that's when I draw them. I kind of, I kind of feel them like they're field guides. Because I see myself as an archaeologist. I you know, I found these and then I and I then I name them. I take the time to like I put all that effort, I'm going to slowly think about what this meant, you know? And then I presented each one to Tracy, Alexander, and Liz. And then I went to the dean about that, and that was really powerful. He had some great questions. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I didn't know what's going to happen, because I was supposed to make one. And, it was, <laughs> and then I was, and they were going to send the rest back, <laughs> right? And then, like, I go home thinking, man, that was really powerful. I haven't heard from him. This is two weeks. I thought I did a good job. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I was getting scared. I was like, damn, I thought I did good. And Alexander um, said, like, everything's good. We, we're having another meeting. I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, I understand. This is an institution. Things take time. And then Mindy, I guess a week later, like, texted me. You better call me. You know? So I was like, oh, sheesh. You know? So I called her. Like, Mindy, what's going on? Yo, Dante, they're getting on six! <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was like, uh, 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 uh. That's what I did, seriously. I went, uh, uh, uh. You know? I'm telling you the whole story. It's how it happened. You know? And then it was like, damn, look what I did. I wasn't even trying to do all six. I was just feeling the vibes here and wanting to be a part of something better than myself. And look what, look what fruits came from that. Once again, talking about the bulb shit, look at the fruits that come from that. And now, you can bring those fruits to other people. So it did what it's supposed to do. Yeah, so now you know the whole story. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will have to be our story that we end on. We are nice. Time, but uh, will you please help me thank Dante. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming too.
I really appreciate it. And like, I'd love to talk to anyone if, if you want to talk later. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man. It was fun, though. I'm looking forward to going to your studio, brother.